Hey, yeah. nice to see you. Hi, hi. If I look like uh, I'm in the Stasi or a retired uh, <laughs> East German, uh, <laughs> I apologize. But no, but it's a kind of appropriate. You know, I was when going into all of the uh, the very cool '80s fair. You guys, you really had a uh, handle on something and know and knew how to end the other thing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we actually. Uh, got to record some Sparks records in Germany and actually cross over in Berlin into Stasi territory once. So yeah. what, what was that like? Um, it, was a, it was a very different type of reality. There was, uh, you had to exchange a certain amount of money uh, and you couldn't exchange it back. So you had to buy something. And I kept looking for like a school store, something where I could just buy you know, folders, pens, anything. And so I got some of that, but I did get a cloisonne pin of the radio tower, which was kind of their iconic communist uh, uh, long like needle tower. So that was good. But it was, yeah, it was very grim, very, even the light seemed different. It was strange. And there was a lot, there were ruins still along their side of the wall in places. And now of course, uh, a year or two after that whole area got cleaned out, I mean, it's, uh, I don't think there's more than 50 feet somewhere that's recognizable from that era. So. Well, speaking of Sparks, you know, I, I saw that documentary like a week ago for the first time. And <laughs> only because the, your publicist, Carrie, said everyone's got to run out and see this. And I found it interesting. It was also cool to see, um, uh, What's his name? Gary. Uh, Gary Stewart. Yeah. 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 And I actually I live a couple blocks here in Highland Park, Illinois, with his first cousin, Jennifer Solomon. Oh, wow. And yeah. and so I, I I felt like I had somebody that I could grieve with in no, the I, area yeah. Yeah. When, when he when he passed. But you know, I always marvel at all the technology that's going on right now specifically with artists who have the opportunity to make a, a record at home or do something and, and network and, and post it and use all the social, uh, social media platforms. But that increases my awe of people who got to make records in a time with, with real labels. And you fall into that category. You, you, know, you, you came in and sort of like your own indie, but you were there at the at the right time, and when I say the right time, for me at least, I, I think I was thirteen and nineteen. Well, in nineteen eighty three, and everything it was like such a healthy change, you know, from like the Ambrosias and stuff like that. No disrespect to those guys, but it's it's that's when sort of the new wave in rock and roll sort of got me in its grips, and then made me want to check out everything that was old, like Bob Dylan to like. Frankie Lyman and so the bands had short hair again and it was just a very cool time and right yeah. before Carrie had asked me to talk to you which I was absolutely thrilled I had just I had watched you on on um Dick Clark when he's interviewing oh, yeah. everybody yeah that must have been thrilling tell me about yeah, how you got you there American Bandstand half a dozen times I mean it was great Sparks we did a lot of television uh I mean, that they're obviously a visual pair. Uh, but um, in the United States at that time, it was kind of their most popular radio time ever in, in this country. And uh, so consequently, we did Solid Gold, American Bandstand, Saturday Night Live, you know, and then there was all kinds of live performance shows, rock and roll tonight. There were a bunch of them. So, I mean, there are literally hours of, of concerts uh, from that era. Uh, and that was pretty great. Um, even later on in, in Devo, it was kind of different. They weren't the same kind of visual band doing those kind of shows, but with the males, it was great. And then we did a lot of that in Europe as well. So I probably have four hours of TV that we did, which, I like, yeah. Tell me, yeah. tell me about how the, the road, the road to California. You know, where you're from, you went to high school in Barrington. Yes, that's that's yeah. I, yeah, I. Uh, it's funny. I I 
the Sparks part of it is I really liked them in Chicago. Mm-hmm. I was a total Anglophile and, you know, Art Rocks, Bowie, Roxy Music, Sparks were kind of my thing. And I finished high school, bought a big drum set, a Ludwig set from Chicago. Uh, and I moved into the city to start playing. And this was like 75. And even at that point, um, there were tons of clubs and you could honestly make a good living playing live music. But uh, it was cover songs. You would play uh, these clubs where you would play songs of the day. You know, it, it could be good. We played Kinks and Bowie and, you know, Roxy songs. And I even convinced one band to do a Sparks song. But it was not geared to original music. So people would still want to go out and see stuff, but not, but stuff they'd already heard. Uh, there was a niche for uh, original stuff, but most of that was New York or California. So anyway, so I played for a long time and really got to be a good musician because you played three hours a night. And Cheap Trick were kind of the only original band in Chicago area at that time that seemed like they could, you know, they had their heights set a little higher. Um, and we ended up, I ended up in a group with the same management and that, and we were playing around, but I literally got a phone call, like a, the call of destiny from a friend of mine that worked on the West Coast with Kim Fowley. And Fowley was put, he had put together the Runaways by then and a group called The Quick, which incidentally were very Sparks-like. And he was trying to do a punk rock band called Venus and the Razor Blades. And this friend of mine, Scott Goddard, said, oh my God, there's this guy in Chicago. You have to get him out here. He's, you know, total power pop, total Anglo guy, but he plays really hard, da, da, da. And Kim Fowley, to his credit, he called me up and he gave me the spiel. And I like dropped everything, packed up my van and moved to California. He, he I said- I wish yeah. I heard that conversation. That sounds- His, oh my his God. the key thing he did, was and it was kind of brilliant he said name name two or three of your favorite artists and he did the kind of um what's it called the uh connective thing uh networking you yeah, know no there's the expression uh it's the actor oh my god i'm spacing out on it oh oh but, connectivity yeah but it's like three steps away from oh, oh, my god. oh yeah kevin bacon Kevin Bacon, right. Right, right, right. So it's like, oh, I knew this other actor and he was in a play. Yeah. So, I did, so he said, name three groups. So I think I named, uh, it was big on like uh, John Cale, um, Velvet Underground. And he goes, oh, okay, John Cale. When I was in England, I produced a uh, group family. John Cale was in the session right next door. And you know, he connected like all of my idols that he knew. And it's like, I'm going to get you to that point. I'm wow. in that circle. And I was like, and he said, you know, where are you now? Mid, you know, Wisconsin. And I'm mm-hmm. like, you're right. I'm coming out. And so anyway, the group fell apart pretty quick after I got out here, but I stayed and I owe Kim Fowley getting me to California. I was sad when he died. I used to see him at Cantor's just sitting, yeah. you know, with his whoever. I mean, not, I also saw Rodney Bingenheimer, but this was towards the end and he just looked and I just saw the women at the table with him, just on <laughs> eggshells. Like he just, uh, and I was gonna, I had corresponded with him once. I was fascinated that he'd been in the army. And, and uh, I, I wrote him and he wrote me back. It was very nice, but it was, uh, you know, what I knew about him has always fascinated me. By yeah. the way, I, John Cale scored a documentary I made. I'll send it oh. to you. Okay. Yeah. He was always on, you know, in a weird way. And he always was like relaying information. He, uh, he, and he was never interested in anything after it got the record deal, pretty much. He mm-hmm. was like all about street level formation. And he really kind of couldn't care less after that point. He would move on to the next thing. Um, so, you know, he, but he would tell you, it's like, I, I'm not going to make you rich, but I can make you famous. And that was kind of his, his line. I can, I can get you in the door. And he kind of followed my career after that group split up. The first time I played at this club, the Starwood out here, like the voice of God over the intercom, it was like, 
David Kendrick, I see you're in a new band playing at the start. It was pretty funny for a while. That's great. But was yeah. so that must have been a a, a dream for any 19, 20 year old kid to go. Is that how old you were when you made yeah. it out? To, yeah. I, I came out that. and uh, you know, when we were Put, I only worked with them for a couple of days before it didn't work. But it's like I met Mars Bonfire from Steppenwolf was just there hanging out. So yeah, it was totally immersed in this world. And even, even hearing about California, you just you, there was this thing called the Antelope Freeway. And you know, <laughs> these names that were so exotic. It's in snowy Chicago. It was yeah. Like, I formed kind of a power pop band, I guess you'd call it, called the Continental Miniatures. Mm -hmm. with a guy from out here and people, uh, two songwriters and a, another friend from Chicago. And we actually got signed to London Records, like really pretty quickly and put out a single and it charted. And this guy, Michael Lloyd, who at a period when he was a teenager worked with Fowley in real kind of arty stuff like uh, uh, The Smoke and, and um, West Coast Experimental Pop Art Band. But at that point, he was, at this point where I got involved, he was doing Leif Garrett, Sean Cassidy, really like pop pop. And he thought we were, we did a Dusty Springfield song and he liked that fact that we kind of harkened back to the sixties like that. Which and that was one? our first single. And he kind of changed his tune about wanting us to do our own original stuff after that single. But anyway, so. Which was the thing, which, which Dusty song? Oh, Stay a While. Okay. And it charted like a lot of places in the in the world, even like to 80 or something here in the States. And so it was that dying of encouragement. We were like, oh, this isn't so hard. <laughs> and then, you know, ever since then, it's like you kind of keep keep ringing up the ladder. So and at that age, it's you're usually pretty yeah. positive. It seems oh, like yeah. anything was satisfying to you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you could yeah. tell I, you seem like a glasses half full kind of person. In general, I am. I mean, I've been, it's like at some level, like Sparks were one of the bands I idolized growing up in Chicago. They were like, and I ended up playing with them a couple of years later. I mean, there's not a lot of careers where that kind of stuff happens, I guess. So is yeah, that, is it, did you, very gratifying. what did you learn playing with those guys in terms of, you were there for the recording process, obviously, and the composing yeah. was, you know, that, that whole film was such an assault on all my senses in the- Yeah, it's, it's exhausting because it's 25 records in depth. Yeah. At the time I joined, they had done two records with Georgia Moroder that were unbanned-like and it was all in the studio. And they were frankly very much missing being a group at that point. And, and um, they came to see, I was in Bates Motel with Les, they came to see us as a band and we were like, you should produce a demo for us. And they were like, you know what? These guys are pretty good. We want to really have a band again, you know, like be a band. So when we first got the gig, playing with them was learning songs from scratch, literally just hear some chords and there would maybe be kind of a nonsense vocal line and a title, but not even lyrics. And we actually learned with the drum beats. We learned everything as five guys in a room, which to me was like amazing with these guys. And the weirdest thing for me, then we went to record them in Europe and we would do one song at a time. We'd do the basic track then put more stuff on then the next basic track. So I was there for all six weeks of doing the records, which is again, that whole process of going overseas, making a record all day long, six weeks in a studio is like, that is just extinct, you know? And I was really happy to be part of that era of time because there is, that was pretty great. Where was the studio? It, it was England. Music Land Studios. It was, it was Georgia Moroder's studio. And I mean, it was a big studio. It was in the, in the basement in a area uh, that was part of an unused uh, subway station. So it had amazing echo and stuff. But it was like used by like, we were in there, then Queen were next, Rolling Stones cut black and blue there. It was a big rock studio. And we were there for this producer, Mac, who was a produced under pressure and all those things in that studio. Like oh, really? the year we were there, we did two records there. 
and sitting at the same console and board. Oh yeah, all of that, all Unreal. of that. Like, yeah, and and a week after we left, like Queen were in that same, you know, sitting in the same chairs, drinking out of the same coffee. You know, it was That's pretty exciting. Cool. Yeah. We, but by that time, had you recorded a lot, not, not with Sparks, but you know with Bates Motors, had you had enough experience in a studio? Yeah, I had done, with, with uh, Continental Miniatures, we ended up doing one full-length record, and then I had done the Michael Lloyd sessions. But um, that was kind of a special thing, because it was my first time, I guess you'd say as a hired hand, not my own group. And, you know, we... Kind of, I think, lived up to expectations for sure. They wanted a a live rocking band again, uh, you know, like kind of the English period after the very beat the clock kind of era. The first album, the beat the clock one, did pretty good, and the second one was one of their least favorite records. So they've kind of copped to it. The uh, uh, but it had a hit in France, so we we were a live band to play, you know. A tour first and then cut records with them. Sparks always look forward. They're never, that movie was as close they have, and they weren't really doing it a lot, but they're always on to the next project. I mean, they're very artful in that way. Are you like that at all? Do you, do you have? I, I am, absolutely. I, um, I'll go through times where I like to listen to stuff I've done, but I always am, I kind of have a dual career. I'm a writer, songwriter too, lyrics mostly. So I always have a band where I'm doing that. And then there's usually other groups I'm playing drums in, currently in Shoo Shoo and, and uh, a couple of different things. So some things just as a drummer, some as a writer, and then some as both. Have you, do you compose as well uh, music? Uh, to some degree, but I'm kind of lyric driven. Um, in fact, that's usually the first thing that shows up for my projects is words. And then um, turn them over to a friend that's better at other instruments than me. Th to the point you mentioned with technology, I love how inexpensive it is to do things now versus like 1980s when to make a record, it was a preposterously expensive, you know, in a big studio. And then videos after a year or two turned into, oh, great. So it's another $50,000 to try and get your song, you know, all of that. But now I'm still a collaborator and I don't like doing everything myself. I want to play with other people. That's why I like playing live, but it's also why I like writing with a partner and make something larger than, you know, the individuals as a, as a whole. I mean, to me, in the history of bands, that's always what I like about bands. It's, it's all the whole setup of it, not, not just the songwriter. So did, did you have favorite bands in you said you were an anglophile but did that include like the move and like oh yeah move kinks i was a big psychedelia fan but yeah like move kinks the who you know cream i mean i had the worst uh drum influences learned to try and play drums it's like ginger baker and keith moon were my favorite drummers you know like lead drummers so <laughs> I, I had to rein it in in certain projects very much but uh, Oh yeah, I, I, and the Beatles, of course. I mean, you can't, you know. I mean, you can't deny. And Dave Clark Five. I mean, all you know, all, all that stuff. All that stuff. My 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 friend. It's it's another weird. I love how stuff works out, and I love that I'm talking to you because I remember, also a couple months ago, I I told a friend of mine because we were talking about how hard. You know, there's all these great stories about not being able to get the right drum sound like Bruce Springsteen trying to get it from Max Weinberg because he just didn't, you know, he was ignorant about the technology, but then you had this whole gated drum sound in the eighties. Oh yeah, the gated re echo return, yeah. Yeah, but I sent him, I sent him um, Monster of Love, the Spark song. And I was wow. like, all the drums should just sound like this. It's just so out there and like, it, it hits you. And it's, it's like that yeah, same crap. They're, they're High tech, but trashy, kind of. That they they're mixed both. I can tell you a secret about how those were recorded. We first of all, they were live played. We did like guitar, bass, drums. We, everyone played together, and Russell even would do kind of a nonsense vocal. And the, the weirdest thing, Ron Mail would write the actual lyrics literally the night before 
they were going to be cut, which to me is the polar opposite of the way I work. I saw he, he would have a title and that's it. But anyway, so what a we, blessing I, to have that kind of speed to be able to do something. Yeah, no, well, and he, it, he would concentrate on that one song and like he obviously needed a deadline <laughs> for the words. But so we cut the whole thing and then I overdubbed in a tile bathroom a second snare track. Cool. Like ear splittingly loud in there, but all the rolls and a second snare track. And that's what kind of gave it that I kind of trashy goosh this thing. Oh, and so it wasn't it. really that effect so much as just a tile room and two tracks of the same drums. So there you go. I was just thinking when you mentioned fifty thousand dollar videos, I just like that I said the sex this are you ready for the sex girls video didn't cost oh, no 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 I, it's funny we um <laughs> that's my favorite I love oh, that thank you. Yeah. it was so cute like you guys are like just cooking you, you know oh. or making a pie yeah we were going <laughs> for the exact I guess opposite of what would be expected with that song title and, yeah and I frankly still I bake to this day so yeah, yeah. we actually made pies you must be talking about this particular record yes I yes yes I, I I'm you you're still baking and I'm still looking for women without any faults <laughs> yeah it's just uh what a what a throw did you did you write that yeah 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 though my words um less yeah after Bates Motel and then doing the Sparks record we were we kind of figured actually on some of these I should just mention the on some of these new releases there's some Bates Motel demos that you kind of show where we were at and there were some great songs that to me sounded like new wave power pop hits and they didn't get us signed so when sparks said want to be our band we just i you know of course i wanted to but we all jumped ship immediately and yeah and they were big in europe they were espresso drinkers and movie fans so it's like come on it's everything we love was it were you uh, alone did you have like-minded friends in high school that were that were into this kind of stuff I had two really good music friends in high school. Yeah, the Anglophiles and then like Sun Ra and, and you know, like uh, Art Ensemble Chicago, really kind of art damaged jazz. So I kind of had those two things going. Were you into, uh, were you into jazz drummers like Elvin Jones or, or? Not then so much. I am yeah. now far more, but um, then I was pretty straight, pretty much kind of rock. Although the guys I liked, uh baker and and you know the drummer from can they they all had those elements in them or they knew that stuff so somehow it it you know somehow it crept in but it really wasn't until later till i got really into uh blakey and then you know billy cobham and crazy drummers that peter are, erskine tech, yeah are technically so beyond me uh i mean i'm I think because I write lyrics, my drumming style is distinct and I play not just with the bass, but I play in a song context. That's kind Absolutely. of- Absolutely. I don't think, I think that the, the two frame or the two schools should be, you know, Keith Moon couldn't have played the, you know, you know, a giant steps unless he was really, uh, you know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? It's just, he could, it, it's, I always, the same drummer friend of mine who's fantastic, he's played with everybody and he's toured and, uh, he um i said how does how do these guys keep their their attention for 20 minutes 30 minutes <laughs> even on like a shuffle or something it, they're just they're in it it's like a basketball game you know yeah. it's 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 it, it's it blows my mind but uh i was going to say one more thing about the uh going from a band that's trying to get recognition bates motel to really being plunged into a a lottery type of win for you yeah that was how far were you living from the studio like tell me about london in those days well we 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 cut the records in munich in germany oh munich i'm sorry and yeah we were not it sparks it seems like they always had one area of the world they were popular and when uh i came in at the tail end of they had one hit in france uh when i'm with you so we, we were huge in France playing wise, and, but we cut the records in Germany. And then the, those records, because of this K-Rock kind of rock of the eighties, new wave element, that was timing. And it launched them into the biggest radio time they ever had in the States. 
So there were, I was with them for a five album period. And the first couple, the first three were like the most radio play they ever had in the United States by far. And so that's why we were doing all that TV and, and, and touring so much. Um, Dick Clark seemed really nice. Oh, he had, he actually is a totally nice guy. Yeah, he was, there was no, and he had, you know, I think they had been on well, at least once before in the early days. Uh, no, he liked having them on because we, you know, they're, they're eccentric. They're, a, they're an interesting pair. I, I, I like, you know, for personal reasons, I love that two Jewish boys from, from Los Angeles were really, really popular in Germany, <laughs> you know, 40 years after the war. And that's yeah. great. So, but but back to the the material that you were working on that you're re-releasing now. Tell me how that yeah. came about. I was just getting to so after Sparks and after Gleaming at first after Base Motel did not get a deal and after Sparks, where it's like these guys are artists. They are they live modestly, but they they're they're doing exactly what they want to be doing. Les and I, who Les was the bass player in in Bates Motel. I joined Bates Motel after they had already started. We said, you know what, we're just going to write about what matters to us, kind of like, so they, a lot of them were kind of like film seeming, like soundscapes of kind of de depressing sexual situations, the end of the world. I mean, there were like all of that stuff. And feel good music. Uh, yeah, cons yeah. <laughs> consequently, it was not like set up for a guitar based drum band necessarily. But what, what, what became this first record was um, what we thought were going to be demos. And we did them with this guy, Steve Haig, who is a brilliant synth guy and really kind of all around musician. And we wrote the songs and, and he added a lot of texture stuff. Uh, but, you know, there would be a, a ballad. There'd be some crazy psycho things. There would be literally a guy trying to self-hypnotize himself and like falling to pieces emotionally in the course of the song and there were some that were like like literally like a film a film shoot like a, a last year marion bad there was one and then yeah we were both big noir fans so a couple of them had that kind of just dark you know going nowhere good but going there fast kind of vibe um and i we both loved that and said well so we were we finished the songs and really liked it and then we were still working with Sparks. So this guy, Robbie Fields, who was at an indie label, Posh Boy, who had mostly punk rock stuff, he got a copy and he came, I think, to one of the Sparks rehearsals. And he said, I, I wanna, I like this. I mean, I wanna have sign you guys. And we're like, well, you know, but these are demos. And he goes, no, 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 I like this. And, and I, what's more, like I'm a small label, but I can put this out in a month. And we were like, our mindset before that was get a deal with a major label. It's going to take two years. It's going to cost a hundred thousand. And this guy to his credit came along and said, no, what you're doing is good. Like, this is great. We lie. And this is Ricky Fields. Yeah, this is Robbie Fields. And he said, Robbie I will, Fields. this will, I'm going to, I want to put this out like right away this. And we were like, okay. And it happened, and he put out the one song, Sex Girls, was on a Rodney on the Rock, Rodney Bingenheimer album. And then this album came out while we were in Europe with Sparks, and it became a huge local hit without us even being there to promote it. So it was literally, uh, Rodney Bingenheimer played it like crazy. People genuinely liked the track. It got popular because people liked it. Robbie Fields had no money to pay publicity people. There was no... Payola. I mean, it was people liked the record, and it there's became, no money for payola. Yeah, yeah. So it, 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 it 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 because, off. This is how it should happen. You yeah. Know? So, oh my goodness, how did how did it get into the nerds movie? Um, which is where I heard it because it was we were it was an extremely popular song on the West Coast. There was stations like that in San Francisco and um, San Diego. And we did, we had a, we have a good movie history. We had song, this song was in a lot of teen, their eighties was a big teen comedy, the R-rated teen comedy period. So we had a friend who worked at, at MGM and pitched it and they wanted that song. It was kind of, the song was like, 
it was sort of nerdy. It was like this, this, this was the song that got the guys with that would go to the wrong party, you know, would be at. So we ended up writing another song for that movie about the guys that hosted the wrong party called right. all night party. So anyway, so, and then we, it's we a very song. earnest song. Like it, it, yeah, yeah. It, 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 I, I loved it. Song. Yeah, I did too. The bridge is like, very, to play that live though. That's like, that's a very unexpected bridge. No. They, yes. <laughs> yeah. Sex girls has, it was, has, a lot of parts, yeah. So and key changes. Yes, yeah, so I'm happy that made it back to the Midwest. That was cool to hear that. Yeah, I'm glad. I, I, I wonder. We, I'll ask my my former bandmate if he still has a copy of us doing that because <laughs> yeah. we actually, but we would do it live. We didn't record it, but right, we would. Right. Someone would try to do the 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 sheep sound effects right. in the background. Uh, Oh my goodness. So, but listen, you look great. Like, have you, tell me about your last, you know, several years. You seem like you're oppressible and you still play a lot. Yeah. I, I mean, my, in the last two years, it, it was the first year, nothing much happened. And towards the end of the year, suddenly all these projects are kind of started up. I was playing with this group, Shoo Shoo, the record we did came out this year. This omnivore label uh, wanted to put out all of the Spire stuff together. And so all of that's coming out in September. So suddenly stuff happened, not live so much, but I was never more happy than the beginning of this year after I got vaccinated and, and other people I knew where I could go into a studio again with another human. I sent, you know, files on phones and all kinds of stuff. And as I said, I mean, I love the fact that that can exist, but I am by nature, a collaborator and I like playing with other people. So I so sorely miss that. And How I, do you and Les hook up? In Bates Motel, literally uh, I auditioned. I, we had friends in common. He had seen the Continental Miniatures. I had seen Bates once and we so hit it off. We're both writers and movie people. He's now a screenwriter, really? but we were all, you know, Cormac McCarthy and Paul Bowles and, and crime stuff and film noir. So, I mean, That's honestly, so cool. we were fast friends from day one. Isn't that, isn't that interesting how that works? You know, you'll, yeah. you'll have this sort of, you know, the, the way someone's wrapped tightly or if they're, if they're sophisticated or would be sophisticated, you know, that's the best thing. When you know, I look back and I remember meeting friends that I'm still friends with, we, we talked about it. Elvis Costello for three hours in a kitchen during a party in college, you know, and, or, or it could be about the Beatles or, you know, anybody. And so sure. that, that's, that's a great thing. And you, you, you. Well, especially when you're going to be in a band, you're going to be spending, and there has any modicum of success, you're going to be spending a lot of time together. And especially when you're touring, you're spending a lot of time together. So to be able to get along on, other levels or be able to talk about stuff or whatever is crucial to the existence of a band starting off. And, you know, I've been in groups with kind of, you know, a lot more drama. Bates wasn't so drama, uh, was so it lasted. And it was the whole time we did Gleaming Spires, it was this dual thing. It was uh, Sparks, then back to Spires, Sparks, back to Spires. It worked because, um, we had the core four piece band of Sparks, everyone except Ron and Russell were right. Glee Spires when we played live. So we were literally able to do Spires shows, the, you know, two days after we were done with a Sparks tour or something. Did that affect the songwriting for, for Spires? Having worked with, with Spark? I mean, it's just- oh, You know, people kind of bring that up, but I, Les and I had, like the film stuff, wordplay in common, a, a sense of humor mm -hmm. and possibly mixing like really dark lyrics with kind of humor sometimes. So I think that was there a little bit. Um, the fact that Sparks could make a go of it, I think if anything made us more fearless about just writing kind of exactly what we wanted. Cause it really seemed like, my God, they can write a song about a pineapple. They can write a song about, you know, every single song was a totally different kind of subject and narrative, and they were story songs, and they weren't first person, I, 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 they weren't right. about, you know, boy, girl stuff in any normal sense of the word. Right. So, it, yeah. It's like it high was, opera. Yeah, yes, very much.
So, that, no. You were, how are you doing on time? Do I have a few more? I know, and I was going to ask, it just dawned on me while you guys were doing this, you know, the, the, the world of punk is, is happening. And, and the good ones got out of the punk into the new wave. The ones who were good songwriters, you know, like yeah, even the damned or, or, and then you had the whole thing going on in Los Angeles, but what were, you know, being an Anglophile, did you appreciate people like the clash or? Oh yeah. We, you know, we did shows. We would stay in the same hotel with the clash and they were live. They were super powerful live band. I mean, the records to me, not as much, but I was, on, you know, more like Wire, XTC. I loved kind of lyric driven Isn't stuff. That great? Yeah. And The Damned, that first album, Nick Lowe, whatever. He, I mean, the playing is fantastic. The tempos are super fast, but their playing is incredible. So hmm. that album is, but they're really good songs. That's the thing. Um, at the time, you know, at the time, everyone thought, oh my God, it's so chaotic and crazed. And a lot of it was, but the the best stuff, there are fundamentally great songs lurking underneath. And like, you know, Wire are still like an art band, even then, you know, even though they play in those kind of minimal tempos in that. And Posh Boy had like every LA punk band, at least maybe did a single or something with him. Most went elsewhere pretty quickly. But even out here, there was like, you know, the screen, the earliest stuff, the screamers were pretty artful and weird. You know, it wasn't just the OI stuff, which frankly yeah. is not mine. It's like fascist stuff. stuff. Was more experimental stuff going on. Did you ever get to, did you ever come across Ian Drury? In the no, podcast? I never met him. No, uh -uh. That, that stuff, I recently discovered that. I mean, it's been out, you know, you just like, how did I not listen to that? Or, I mean, it's been around the whole time. And then. Yeah. It just, it, it blew my gourd. So, but this is an exciting time. Have you, um, do you have any shows coming up to promote these these uh, releases of older songs? Well, I don't think Gleaming Spires is gonna do anything live. We're hoping that next year there's gonna be vinyl re-releases. I'm just gonna show these one time because all the I, yeah. them at the same time. So there's hopefully gonna be vinyl releases as well. And we might, Les and I might, try to come up with a, something brand new for that. Good. Um, well, otherwise, I I'm this group Shoo Shoo that I've been starting to work with is going to tour next year, like all over Eastern Europe, Western Europe. Wow. And I'm hoping to be involved. Um, I play with a kind of a psychedelic hard rock group in San Francisco called Revolution. That We're going to New York in about three weeks. Okay. So those are going to be my first live shows. That's uh, awesome. Yeah. So it's just creeping in. Yeah. It's still very hard to connect the dots for a tour in Europe. I mean, if you're big enough to play the Greek theater, you can make it work, but you know, small club, it's still connecting stuff. So it's still down the road a little ways. For we'll me. see how it all works out. You kind of remind me of Clem Burke, the Midwestern version. Ah, it, okay. he's, he's really into all the old, I heard that he had been playing with the Flame and Groovies. Oh and yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, so that's he that's great. Sometimes. Yeah, he's a me. The thing is, I it's like I have never stopped being a fan. I've made a living playing and I play in really famous bands, but I've never stopped wanting to hear like, oh my God, I want to hear that Chilean psychedelic band I've never heard. I'm always looking, you know, and and so I, I am consequently never, I could never be in a band that is like a heritage act that plays the same seven songs at state fairs i could just never do that you know so yeah. i'll take um, I'll, I'll have you taken out if, if that if <laughs> and frankly the next scene will be like you in a i don't know who i with that could do that <laughs> you'll be but, like at the louisville fairgrounds playing <laughs> fortunate son <laughs> no but i it i it, you it's, it's about community and that's actually what 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 you really make me think about because there's only so much uh, self-flagellation or, or playing on the couch or yeah, no. doing stuff. It's fun to do that. And you're lucky because you've, you've, you've come across some great people to collaborate with. Yeah, no, I have. I mean, I've, throughout my career, I've had maybe half a dozen songwriting partners that have been super successful with my Empire of Fun thing and that. And then I've played in 
bands that I admire, Devo, Sparks, that are artful and very unique. Uh, and then, you know, my, my to frankly, my time in Sparks, the first couple of records, I think is one of their best periods. I mean, I'm so happy and grateful that it came across that way. Me and too. although my time in Devo was kind of on the, I, what the, the other side of the cusp, I guess, a little bit, you know, the smaller label, but that last record, Smooth Noodle Maps, is an excellent record, and it's just, I'm happy it got re-released a few years back. Did you ever play Fräulein, the song? You, the, what's the, that? The Devo song, Fräulein. Did you ever Fräulein. play that? We, yeah, we, the very first show I did with them, we played all super early tracks. It swings. And, I, yeah. I, I heard them do that, and I said, wow, they sound like they're playing Cab Calloway right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, do 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 I was like, wow, this is the best. You know, Cab Calloway, it's, yes. it's kind of depressing, but in a sense, he did the best music video of all time, and it's never been better than uh, St. James Infirmary yes. Blues, where Max Fleischer did all the Betty Boop serial yep. animation. It, it, it's just... It's like music music video peaked in 1929. <laughs> it's it's true. unbelievable. And the playing of that band was incredible too. Oh yeah, my favorite Cap Calloway tune is Kicking the Gong Around. Because yeah. he's, he's, he's pantomiming like, uh, it's almost like a, um, a prediction of what would happen in Los Angeles in the 70s and 80s. He's like yeah. just like snorting and just like doing this with this. Rock. But it, it was such a nice thing. It was so nice talking to you. Yeah. This Let's stay in touch. Uh, will do. And I'm gonna, I'm, um, yeah, I'm and, follow you closely. Thank you. And I'm I'm happy the world is opening back up and Me too. So like venues and stuff. We made it through. So I want to see people in them again. Thank so, you, David. Much. Take care of yourself. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye.